Welcome. I am your host, John Cavendish, and welcome to the Amazon Strategist Show, the show where it's all strategy and no hacks. No silver bullets, no magic pills, just real practical strategy for serious Amazon sellers. So today, we are joined with, by Laura Meyer from Envision Horizons. Uh, Laura is an industry expert with over 10 years' experience in retail and marketing. Her work as a member of Amazon's media team led her to founding Envision Horizons, helping brands grow their business to their full potential on Amazon. Laura and her, and her team are 41, and as she told me just before this call, growing someone new in Prime Week, which is crazy, have helped over <laughs> 200 brands scale on Amazon in the last five and a half years. She also has her own brand with her husband, and they're on track to do two and a half million this year, which is amazing. So um, welcome, Laura. Thanks for coming to the Amazon Strategist Show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. As we were chatting about before we got on this call, um, Viv, um, our producer, has been doing some sleuthing, um, found some very interesting stuff, and found that you have a dog who is potentially more famous than all of us and our businesses combined. Um, how did that happen? That happened because when I left my prior job to start Envision, you know, when you're starting a business, things can be kind of slow in those first six months. And I am someone who likes to go, go, go. And I was also just super intrigued by the influencer business model, let's call it. And I am not one to post bikini pics for thousands of people. So instead, I pimped out my dog, who was a puppy at the time. And honestly, I had so much fun with it because at the time, I was living in New York City and I was basically networking with all of these other pet influencer owners or you know, dog parents. Um, and I even took it as far as getting my dog a booking agent and he was booked on some various commercials and like pop-up activations, which it was just a lot of fun. You know, I got mm -hmm. to meet Doug the Pug and some of these other like ultra famous yeah. pet influencers in the process. Uh, and, you know, to be honest, it, it's not like I made really money doing it. Um, mm -hmm. I probably spent more money building, you know, buying the outfits and the nice camera and whatever. Uh, but it was just a really fun uh, pet project, pun intended. So is it the same as like the real influencer space? So really you're paying for the reach of your pet. So when they hire you, they want you to share it. And is it that, yes, that type of thing? Ex exactly. And, you know, it gets pretty competitive. People <laughs> take it very seriously. Um, and, What's always funny is, you know, at the end of the day, we love our pets, but they are animals, right? And they don't always act the way you wish they would, mm -hmm. kind of like children. And there were a few cases where I was at these pet influencer pop-ups or activities where they pay or invite a lot of pet influencers. And there were some dog fights, both figuratively and quite literally. Wow. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it was always interesting. Awesome. I guess we have to talk about business and real business. Um, not that pet Instagram couldn't be a real business if we like scaled it. So how did you get into Envision Horizons? So what started the inspiration for Envision Horizons was when I worked for Amazon's media group in New York. And the biggest objections I was getting from my, on my sales calls uh, where, hey, Amazon advertising sounds great, but my retail business is a hot mess. And light bulb moment, oh, well, there must be an opportunity here to help brands clean up the mess mm. and help them build a really solid foundation. And then they can add fuel to the fire with Amazon advertising. And what's interesting to reflect on is like, this was such a different time, even though, it wasn't that long ago. This was like back in 20 or yeah, 2015 when there were still 10 cent cost per clicks on Amazon, which yeah. we'd all love to have that today, but that's just not the case. And then I ended up working for another ad tech company where I actually brought Amazon on as a advertiser for this firm. And quite frankly, always had that entrepreneurial itch um, it was actually my minor in college. And 
then I made, a, you know, I kind of took my commission from the Amazon deal and then started Envision Horizons in early 2017. Super cool. And so was that your first entrepreneurial business on Envision Horizons? Yes, it is. Uh, cool. I, 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 I'm trying to think there's been like little things along the way, but not really. I mean, I grew up working in my dad's hardware store in Michigan. So I joke that our family trips were to the Ace Hardware shows in Orlando or Las Vegas. <laughs> So I guess in that way, I've always been around retail. Uh, super cool that your first business, you know, you've done so well with it. Like how, how did you incorporate the lessons as you went along? You know what I mean? You know, not without a few tears, right? Mm. Like it's hard <laughs> and it's a, a continuous roller coaster for sure. I, I think the biggest thing is being self-aware and admitting those failures. I, I could talk the rest of today on a lot of the big failures I made earlier on. Um, I think some of the er early and even things I didn't fine tune until probably two years ago is hiring the right people. Like I got really lucky with one of my first team members. And then I was building my business uh, without any external capital. It was completely bootstrapped. So I was hiring really young, really green talent. And what I underestimated is the amount of work that is for me and the work that takes away. There's such an opportunity cost with that, right? And that's not to say that you can't hire young and green talent and build them up. That's still very much a strategy for us, but you need to have that manager in place or someone else who's not the business owner who's going to help train them and mentor them because you can't be having a fresh out of college team member expressing, you know, some concerns they may have that are just, or maybe not just when you have other stresses of the business. And sometimes those two things don't really blend well because their problems seem so trivial. And I guess, having a little more compassion is, is something that I've worked on too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's, that was one of my insights recently as well. Like the kind of, you know, that the curve of leadership, the growth of leadership is actually, they all say, don't they like, I'll oh, care about your people or care about your people first, actually help them achieve their goals. But I felt like when I first started out, I was just like, I need to make this work no matter what. Yeah. And then as, you know, as success comes and growth comes, it's more of a, oh, I, now I can really figure out how to help people achieve what they want to achieve. Well, because in those early years, especially if you're bootstrapped, it's straight survival. Yeah. And when you see businesses like Facebook giving all of these wild benefits and that becomes the norm and the expectation, you can't compete with that. Like, you don't, if, if you're bootstrapped, you don't have millions or billions of dollars in your bank account to go and offer your entire team a $10,000 home office stipend during COVID. Like those things just aren't reality when you're a smaller business. But I do think it's really important, like you, like you mentioned, as your business grows, as your business scales, I'm a huge believer in obviously sharing the success with my team. And as my business has grown, my average salary across the board has grown. We do a very transparent bonus pool um, and, and also like really good people, their salaries grow really quick within my firm. So like, I usually start at say like what I would consider like a fair, maybe like mid-level industry average, but if they're rock stars, I want to do whatever I can to keep them and keep them happy, both financially, but also work-life balance is another huge thing for us too. Awesome. And yeah, I totally agree. Like because we can't afford to just pour money in as a bootstrap company, like culture becomes like the mm -hmm. thing, doesn't it? Like, how do you make it like the best place to work where nobody ever wants to leave, even though that they can earn double legitimately working yeah. for somewhere else if they're good people, because people are paying stupid money right now. Aren't they? Totally. Especially like in the US. My, yeah. Like my, uh, one of my developers who left us in October because Amazon scooped her up and, I, I'm assuming offered her double and they were going to sponsor her through her PhD. Like this woman's <laughs> brilliant. She's my, we, we hired her right out of college, but 
she is by far the most mathematically intelligent woman I've ever met in person. And, you know, she's 24, 25 now. I forget her age. But, wow. you know, when she left, she like she was in tears. She she loved it. But I also was totally aligned with her. I was like, you can't pass up this opportunity. Like, one, you're going to make more money. But, you know, you love math. You love learning so much. And they're going to sponsor that. I can't do that. And I'm like, hey, maybe when my business is big enough in a few more years, I can afford to bring you back. Yeah. And I agree. It'd be great to have these people circle back, wouldn't it? And come back as like junior partners, I, maybe just to, to come join. Yeah. I, I actually had my first boomerang come back in April. So hmm. I had mentioned earlier, I got really lucky with my first employee or first team member being amazing. Well, he did end up leaving, I think in 19. And then he went in, did some consulting himself. He even worked at Thrasio. And that's when I recruited him back. And since he's been back, things have been amazing. <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing when people do that, isn't it? Uh, our business dev lead, uh, sales and team lead, he he just came back after two years away consulting and building his own agency. And, you know, the skill set you built yeah. from that is is so amazing. Agreed, agreed. Yeah, it's it's a I, I think a piece of advice for anyone building a business is to really try and get other leadership team members who think from a business owner's perspective. Mm. not just a management or leadership perspective. Yeah, I completely agree. How do you hire and how have you changed your process from hiring all these green people? I understand that they're running around, they don't really know what they're doing. And also they don't know how to communicate professionally necessarily in yeah. the right way. Yeah. <laughs> how, do you, how do you now hire and hire and train those people? I don't, as in I personally don't. That's why it's better. <laughs> I think yeah. a big part about being a business leader is being self-aware of what you're not great at. And I'm a very much like go, go, go. I like to do business development and sales. Like that's really where my heart is at. And things like training and HR, that's not where my heart's at. So mm. why it's so much better is I hired the right people for those seats. And, you know, you mentioned you're an EO. Traction is obviously a book that they love. And I also think it's a great book. And, mm. you know, one of the big conclusions of that book is you need to have the right people in the right seat. And what I would say is when you're hiring for what I would call like a new department necessarily, like let's say you're hiring for HR or you're hiring. So perfect example, we're, um, we're building out an influencer arm of our business because we have seen such success with driving external traffic to Amazon. And, you know, I'm not going to go hire a super junior person to lead that department. Instead, I'm going to hire someone who can captain the growth of that department and, you know, take the financial risk of just hiring a more expensive person. But mm. that means the success rate of it hopefully is going to be a lot better. I think that's an amazing tip, like hiring, especially as visionary CEOs who don't want to be the people that micromanage and train hiring mm -hmm. a person who is competent already and has the drive to just tell you, like, I mean, what are some questions that you'd like to ask them in the interview to, to see if they're the right person? Yeah. So when it comes to interviewing, um, I know it's cheesy and this is probably shared in all over the web, but, you know, core values is a really big thing. And our interviewing rubric is built off of our core values where you hmm. score them on your core values. We also do 360 reviews twice a year mm -hmm. and those are built on our core values. And the reason we do the 360 reviews is it also makes it very objective if someone is underperforming. Mm -hmm. And then we work with them to build a performance improvement plan to get them to that level. And, you know, I've, I've actually had some team members who we've put on these performance improvement plans and they stepped up to the plate. And I kind of got some bad advice in my earlier days of people never change. If they suck in the beginning, they're going to suck forever, like really pessimistic advice. And I've learned that that's not the case. But if someone really isn't performing and you set those objective goals and they're not hitting it, you need to pull the plug fast. Like you can't, especially in a service business, but even in like a, a consumer product business as well, you don't want to risk until that mess up happens and it costs your business a lot of money. So we've developed 
questions around that. The other things that I really look for in the interviews I conduct is I tee them up to see if they are going to say anything negative about a prior employer. Everyone asks us, like, what's your culture like? Do you have a positive culture? Well, my belief is that one of the best ways to have a positive culture is to have positive, positive team members, right? Like if you have that person who's always complaining, there's the metaphor of, right, like one rotten apple rots the whole bunch or basket. It's, it can be so true. And I, I had a similar experience just being totally vulnerable, like in um, early 21, when the great resignation was happening, you know, I, I had some team members get really clicky and really negative and, you know, they all kind of left at the same time. And it was, it was very difficult for me as a leader, but I use that as a learning experience of like, okay, I need to make sure that I have very emotionally mature people who are coming onto my team and who can handle some of the stress and the volatility. And more importantly, they will come to me if they have a problem and not just gripe with their colleagues. Because the only way to fix something is to raise that issue. And I really try and make an environment where if you mess up or if something's not working, or I read a book and I try and force some processy that's not working because that's happened. I get excited. Um, you know, I want my team to tell me like, Laura, you're nuts. Like we, we can't be doing this, at least not at this pace. Like let's, let's rewind a little bit. And no one gets mad, right? Um, but I think it's hard for maybe some more green or junior or people who came from really toxic corporate environments to have that level of, I guess, or that sense of security that they can say like, this isn't working. So that's, that's one piece is I, I try and see if they, if they go on a rant about how awful their prior boss was, no, like red flag, not going to yeah. move forward. And, and I get it. I've had some toxic bosses, not at Amazon, but at other firms. Like it, it's not fun. It's a terrible experience, but I frame it as it was also a great learning experience for me. You know, I, I learned what type of leader I want to be from the experience. And you just have to put the maybe turbulent times behind mm -hmm. you and reflect on how you can make it a positive thing. That's super cool. And I think that uh, we will get on very well, or we will get on very well, because I feel yeah. like <laughs> Seller Candy is very, very similar to Interesting Horizons mm -hmm. in the way we hire, the way we manage, the way we fire. And to add to what you said, I want to hire people as well as possible, because I hate performance improvement plans, and I hate, uh, I hate it. it's that stuff. So it's like... So painful. People, you can give the benefits of the doubt for as long as possible because you know you hired the right person. And even if they're doing something which seems insane, trying to understand them and be like, why are you doing that? So that mm -hmm. we don't have to like, you know, fire people because it sucks. It's just the it's, worst thing. It's awful. I, I've lost so many nights or, or sleep, I've had sleepless nights like leading up to that awful dreaded call. Like it's, it's not a fun activity, but I think the best way to approach it is where the person isn't surprised, Right. And that's why you have a very objective performance improvement plan of you need to hit this metric by this date. Otherwise, there's grounds for termination. Yeah. And I think where firings get really emotional for everyone is if they feel blindsided or surprised mm. or they thought they were doing better and now the rug's pulled out from under them. And that's been a learning experience for me because... I definitely made some quick fires in the beginning because, you know, I had this advice that people don't change. And yeah. I also was so busy with other things, bootstrapping the business that Alma, I probably lacked some compassion. Like I was in survival mode, not thriving mm. mode. And there is kind of that switch that when your business does get to a thriving mode, and that's a big spectrum because surviving is one piece, but there's different levels of thriving. Mm then you, you really can have the resources to, to properly give someone notice or mm. work with them to discover like, hey, uh, hey, maybe this just isn't the best seat for you. And I've even said to pass the team members like, hey, I think you'd actually be a lot better in this type of seat. And I know people hiring for it. I'm just mm. going to plant that seat. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and yeah, that sounds great. I'm sure your people love love working for you. Yeah. I mean, like I said, maybe not those that 
were with me in the first year or two, but yeah. Well, I mean, I <laughs> nothing, sorry, well. nothing. And you're so talking great. about Casper, yeah. aren't you? You're, you're in survival mode, and you're like, if I keep them mm-hmm. on for an extra five, six weeks, or four weeks, that's an extra five thousand dollars that I could be spending yeah. on this person. Yeah. Totally, every dollar counts at that phase. Yeah, um, I get that, and, 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 and that's why I think it's interesting, like the sex appeal of working for a scrappy startup. <laughs> and, and don't get me wrong, you can learn a lot, um, and you know, if there's listeners out there that are junior in their career, there's a lot of experiences, but you really want to do your due diligence on the founder because it also can be a a total crapshoot. And then you have this business on your resume that no one knows about. Yeah. And it's the insane time, especially if they're operation, if you're operations based of like Mm -hmm. what I'm doing a different thing every single day. Cause I've had many people who've, yeah, not necessarily been negative, but about the previous employer, but have been like, I just was so confused while I was supposed to do this project <laughs> or that project. So, yeah. Yeah. Hey, and that goes back to traction, right? You got to yeah. have the accountability and <laughs> all of that. Awesome. So we've done a bit of a bit of a tangent. I think it's been super valuable. And like how to hire people is, you know, one of the long-term ways of growing a strategic business is definitely not doing it all yourself because it's absolutely insane. Trying to do everything yes. yourself. And we'll just lead eventually to burnout because we all think mm-hmm. we can do everything. I don't actually, but we all think that we can hold everything onto everything until we can't. And then very, very quickly we go down the hill on the other side, don't we? Like the spiral slips. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> so what I was super interested in when I was reading was about your um voyage into SAS. Yes. So how did uh, that come about and what's it do? Yeah. From the very beginning, I knew I wanted to have a technology component to my business. I, even in the earlier days, was always thinking about scale. And as I'm sure you know, there's so many moving parts with Amazon that to really do it at a strategic level right now requires a lot of time and resources. What I was always going through with my agency is, okay, like in the beginning, we could have one account manager manage four accounts, right? But now... You know, and then I would be thinking, how can I use technology to automate all of these things like reporting or analyzing data or inventory reports, things like that that are important, but definitely have the ability to be automated that we're eating up a ton of time. Then, okay, well, now how can we get it so that an account manager with the automation of this can actually manage six accounts or seven accounts or even eight accounts? So that's where it started. Uh, Not only how can we keep the level of service, um, but make it more scalable, but also how can we make it even better with the functionality? Mm -hmm. So we started developing the software and it started in like a macro Excel sheet (laughs) back in 2018. And then the software came out internally at the end of 2019. Mm. And then in March, 2020, we released the interface to our clients. So now our clients could go in and check sales and all the other health metrics. And also as a marketer, there were a lot of metrics that Amazon wasn't giving me that I wanted, Mm. right? Like we, we work with a lot of beauty and CPG brands. So I want to know what's my repurchase rate on Amazon. And I get that now they're starting to roll out some of those things, but you know, new to brand customer acquisition, that's been a metric that we've always tracked. Lifetime value of your Amazon customer, average order value, cross catalog purchase combinations. Those are things that allow you to really make those strategic decisions. And then in 2020, I was really trying to flirt with the idea of how can I have our service offering and our expertise available to businesses that don't qualify for our agency? Because as our agencies become more robust, we've obviously become more expensive. So if you're a brand that does less than a million dollars a year, it doesn't really make financial sense for you to work with my agency unless you have funding and you already have a lot of other really strong revenue channels. So I wanted to develop a solution for businesses that maybe have internal teams or they're just starting out where they can have real-time analytics at the same caliber that they would working with an agency like Envision. So 
our mission with our software is to automate as much of Amazon brand management as we possibly can. And our tool is super robust in that it does everything from inventory management. We're releasing our SEO tracking tool on Friday, which I'm, mm. which I'm really excited about. Where like you can start to see the time series of not only the total number of keywords your product is indexed for, but also you can drill down at the keyword level to see either the progression or deacceleration of your organic ranking. Um, and ultimately what we're working on is we have your actual insights tool uh, or what we call your custom roadmap where we're developing an algorithm that's now going to start to highlight changes or anomalies in the over 80 reports that we consolidate mm. and say like, this is impacting your sales and here's our suggested action because things are always changing. And sometimes it's just knowing what to do with the data that you have. So right now that like the algorithm is very straightforward of like, if you're either low on stock or out of stock, like here's the suggested inventory to send in. If you're mm. losing the buy box, you know, here's the buy box you're losing. Here's the price you could price match. Mm. If you have a suppression, you know, this is the ACE and suppressed, click here to submit a ticket. Those things are like very much our V1, but the V2 and so forth is really going to take into account your organic rate tracking, your advertising performance, and then even start to get into like new to brand customer acquisition is down. Here's some tactics or suggestions on how to improve that. Wow. That's really, really cool. So I guess, how do you price something like that? as a SaaS solution? If I'm being totally honest, we're still figuring out the business model completely. But today, you know, we have our pricing on our website. It starts at $200 a month. And then depending on your order volume, it can scale up from there. And the reason we did it based on order volume is we're super transparent. And the more orders we have to process, the larger our own AWS bill is. So that's why we we tiered it that way. We're, we're not playing the games of like, take the best features and have them mm -hmm. gated for a higher price point. And I just, or like, you know, to have two users instead of one, it's more money. Like it doesn't cost us any more from our perspective for you to mm -hmm. have two users. So we're not going to charge you for it. Cool. No, that's great. And I mean, basically, based on data volume is awesome. And it seems like there's, that's like one of those things where if you played the pricing models, you know, you could be super successful. I mean, or you could burn that model and move on to the next one, but you could charge a fortune yeah. for this if you got it right. Once, once you get it right. Yeah. Well, it, I think that's probably why I'm conservative is we're still yeah. improving the actual insights page. Like in terms of being like an analytics reporting tool, it's awesome. And that's really what you're paying for today but I'm, sh I'm selling in the vision right now <laughs> of where, where we want to take it. No, super, super cool. I love it. So when you got into the SaaS game, did you raise money or did you use your cash flow to do it? Did you do it on the cheap or did you like outsource it to a super expensive dev house? How did you approach that? This is for my yeah. interest. I don't know if anyone's listening. Of who course. Is so I, in that. I, I married my chief technology officer. <laughs> So, so that's how I got it for expensive. the cheap. Wow. Well, yeah, or, very, yeah, or, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm joking. So my, my husband, obviously I, I started dating him long before I started this business, but well, hopefully, uh, he, <laughs> it was all part of my business plan, right? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I'm, I'm very fortunate in that he studied computer science hmm. um, and he actually started his career building the tech stack for Lehman Brothers. And then he left like the engineering side and moved to the trader side. Mm. And like many Wall Street professionals, he eventually got burned out. And I convinced him back in 2018 to join me. Like at that point, I already had some proof of concept. The business was showing some momentum. And I also knew I always wanted to have software as a part of my business model. And so I convinced him, he's actually the one who built like the, the, what I'd say the initial architecture and groundwork in Excel. And then we made that amazing hire, the woman I referenced earlier, right out of college, mm. who was absolutely brilliant. And she's just so smart. Like you, we didn't have to train her. She just ran with it. Right. And then we hired another domestic developer 
And then last year, all of my domestic developers were poached by Amazon. Like Amazon came and just swooped them all. So then what I did was we changed our structure where we still have our own full-time developers, but they aren't US based because trying to hire developers in the last 24 months, I don't have 500,000 I can go spend on one developer. And honestly, it wouldn't be fair to my agency side of the business because they're the ones generating the revenues really at this point. And I need to be paying them, you know, the larger compensation. Yeah. I mean, that makes total sense. And, uh, yeah, it's difficult, isn't it? When, when a few companies who are funded and losing money, I mean, not Amazon's not losing money anymore. I just right. throwing it into the system. And it's the same with brands, isn't it? When we work, when you work with funded brands sometimes and they're like, Oh, this other brand raised so much money that they've just lost led their way to dominating the category, but then they explode yeah. at the end of it. And I've, seen a lot of there's been a major shift with VCs in that I don't know if you've ever read the book Blitzscaling, but Blitzscaling is all about like scaling as fast as possible and not really worrying about the consequences, whether that be profit, people's lives because they end up losing their job when they start to regulate things. Mm. Now it seems like there's been a culture shift with a lot of VCs or other financiers of having stable growth and not Mm. just growth at all costs. And I've always had that mentality, obviously, because I I didn't go and raise millions and millions of dollars and just Mm. ran as fast as possible. I think it's just a better way. This is my opinion. and, And obviously, there's different categories where it can vary. But I think just building a really solid business that is cash it at least turns a profit. At the end of the day, you have a business to make money. Yeah. All of these businesses that are not yet profitable. And I get it, like in biotech, obviously you have to invest billions of dollars and you need that funding before you can actually sell the product because of all mm. the hurdles. But you know, if you're building a agency or even a consumer product or consumer goods business, you know, work hard, save a hundred grand, save 200 grand to get started yourself and then try and do it really organically Mm. because like, I I love the example of hero cosmetics where do it's, um, she was very early in finding the pimple patches and their founder do like she bootstrapped that business for a long time. And then when it really started to take off, that's when she took on investment to take it to that whole next level. And Mm. I once heard this really great advice that, you know, bringing on investors is like bringing on or entering a marriage you can't divorce from because they're in there (laughs) and you need to make sure that they're the right partners for your business long-term as well. Cool. So we've been into a lot of a lot of things. When you said biotech, it reminded me of what was that? What was that thing called? That woman with the deep deep voice? Yes. Yes, uh, Elizabeth Holmes yes. with Theranos. Theranos. I need to watch this series. I haven't watched that yet. Have you seen it? Have you watched so, it? Oh, I listened to the podcast. I watched the HBO show. <laughs> I read the book and I watched the Hulu series. I'm obsessed with it because she's so narcissistic. There's just something really fascinating to me about watching because I mentioned that I've been working, you know, in the beginning, compassion was probably lower, much lower than it is now, but you know, there's still an element like I, because I'm from the Midwest, I joke that like it was instilled in me to really care what people think, um, Mm. which as a business owner can be a huge stress point because you can't keep everyone happy, whether that's clients or team members. And that woman, she just nothing really faced her. And there's something I'm very intrigued about that of being able to bounce off. Now, obviously she's a crook and she lied to a lot of people and that's not honorable at all but being able to like power through volatility is something that is somewhat yeah admirable for me <laughs> i think I, I i know what you're saying and i i also you know, identify with coming from a place like that in the past and it depends whether her yeah. brutality came from like actually being Hiding. a psychopath or whether yeah. it came from like <laughs> you know being so inside your own head that you're like numb, mm. you know what I mean? When you got that mask on, yeah. and you're like, you numb yourself against it, and you're just like, f everyone else in my head, so I can do whatever I want to do, you know? Yeah, yeah. We we have a team Audible account, 
And I have this one book. Now I'm blanking on the name of it, but I can pull it up. But it's basically to like how to not give any Fs. I won't swear on the podcast. Oh, oh the subtle art the subtle art of not giving a F. And you know, it's a he, he's like he's crude and vulgar vulgar on purpose. But yeah. yeah I like sometimes it, I like you just that need stuff. that yeah, you need that reset sometimes. I totally agree. That's super cool. Okay. All right. So if it's okay, we will go straight into the giveaway. So here at the um, Hannah's Strategist Show, we give away to our audience on a weekly basis. We haven't come up with a name for them yet because we keep changing on a weekly basis. Laura has been amazingly volunteered by Tristan to give away three months of My Horizons. And, um, that, and along with that, we have $10 cash, $5 cash, three months of My Horizons. We have $400 reimbursement credit from Seller Candy, our sponsor. We have an A and Amped customer review, your PPC. We have lots of things in there. So we're going to add music afterwards. Let's spin the wheel, Vivian. Oh, no. Laura, do you want to spin the wheel? You just have to say spin the wheel. You just have to say spin the wheel. Oh, spin the wheel. Okay, I was trying to click to spin. <laughs> and someone won the amped custom review so we're gonna have my horizons on there for the future which is really cool so we're we're gonna be having you on our on our wheel until someone wins so sounds good to whoever wins that and uh thank you laura for well volunteering the prize yeah thank you let's do rapid fire questions because they're they're more fun (laughs) all right okay so ready i guess let's do it laura Favorite Amazon, you have one second to answer each one so we can get through. Uh, one, favorite Amazon niche, single word answers. Don't care. Uh, if you could choose no pictures or no reviews, which would you pick? No reviews. Which, uh, name a country that starts the letter D. Denmark. <laughs> which Amazon marketplace is the next big opportunity? Australia, but that's kind of been, that's been around for a bit. I mean, Germany and UK are obviously huge, but I feel like they're kind of established. Okay. Pineapple on pizza, yes or no? No. Oh. Favorite e-commerce podcast? Amazon Strategist, right? <laughs> <laughs> Name something you'd hate to find swimming around in your bathtub. A leech. <laughs> oh. Okay. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> we will be cutting that into the- some hilarious little pieces. People want to contact you, follow you, get more information, stalk you, learn about your dog. Where should they go? Yeah, the best place is LinkedIn. So you can follow me, you can follow Ambition Horizons, you can also go to our website, ambitionhorizons.com. And then, you know, Instagram is more of my personal channel, but I'm on there. Um, It's mostly just photos of my dogs, my baby, and food I cook because now that... Now that I'm on a farm, I have a veggie garden and I obnoxiously post about my, what I call my yard to table meals. <laughs> no, I love it. So thank you so much for coming, Laura. And uh, sorry for rushing you through at the end and really good to meet you. All good. Let's chat again in the future. Yeah. Sounds lovely. And when I'm in Vietnam, I know who to call. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously. We'll, uh, we'll take you out. It'll be awesome. Sounds great. Have a wonderful day. So. Thank you for attending the Amazon Strategist Show sponsored by Salad Candy. So if you want to um, have help with your Amazon business, if you're an agency, if you're an aggregator, and you hate dealing with Amazon seller support, reach out to us at sellercandy.com and we are there to help you uh, deal with Amazon seller support and give you the seller support experience that you wish you always had. So thank you and see you all again next week.